This is Vote 2016, the Pennsylvania Democratic Senatorial Primary Debate. Today's debate is brought to you by 6ABC in Philadelphia and the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania. And now from our 6ABC studios in alphabetical order, the candidates are John Fetterman, Katie McGinty, Joe Sestak, and Joe Vidvaka. Our panelists are anchor and senior producer Ilya Garcia of Univision 65 and action news reporter Vernon Odom. And now your moderator, 6ABC anchor Jim Gardner. Hello and thank you for joining us for this debate among the four Democratic candidates running for the United States Senate from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. They have gathered here at our 6ABC studios for what we hope will be a wide ranging and informative discussion of the major issues of this campaign. Each candidate will have one minute to answer the questions posed to them by myself and our two panelists. If we feel that an issue bears further discussion, we can continue. Each candidate will have an equal chance to weigh in. At the end of the debate, each candidate will have one minute to make a closing statement. So let's begin. Our first question goes to Katie McGinty. Ms. McGinty, we are in the midst of one of the most notable presidential campaigns in anybody's memory, notable for the fact that a substantial portion of the electorate seems to be rejecting the status quo. They are in effect saying to the federal government, you have failed us and we demand something new and something different. Do you see yourself as new and different and if so, <clears throat> specifically how? Well, Jim, thank you very much. And let me just say, I understand where those voters are coming from. The bottom line is that neither this political system nor our economy is working for most families. People are working harder and falling further and further behind. Now, what I bring to that equation and that discussion is fighting for the middle class, standing with working families, isn't for me just a campaign item. It's family, it's personal. Uh, one of 10 children, my dad a policeman, my mom worked to the wee hours in the evening as a restaurant hostess. What I know firsthand is what it is to stretch a paycheck. And also, if you want something, you're gonna have to work for it right, that nobody's gonna make it happen for you. So as United States Senator representing the good people of Pennsylvania, I'll do something very different than what Pat Toomey has done. Pat Toomey has sold out the middle class, but I will be a faithful and firm vote uh, upholding Social Security. I'll stand with taxpayers against Wall Street excesses. I'll stand for universal pre-K, giving our kids a good start, job training and apprenticeship programs. And you know what, Jim? I have faith in Pennsylvania's workforce and the American workforce. No more bad trade deals. Let's put our people back to work, building good infrastructure and revitalizing manufacturing in this country. But for people who are looking for a change in the status quo, do you see yourself as a change in the status quo? Well, I do, because I think the status quo has been all loaded on the side of the well-heeled. And there has not been enough of a voice or a fight for those who are working so hard and their paychecks are shrinking rather than expanding. Look, if you want somebody who's going to go to bat to make sure that we've got solid wages, equal pay for equal work, that's what our families need and that's where my priority will lie. Mr. Fetterman, are you different? <laughs> Loaded question there. Uh, well, again, I, I'm not new because I've been the mayor of, of a town in western Pennsylvania now for 11 years. Um, and uh, what makes me different is, is that uh, it is one of the most challenged communities in Pennsylvania. And it's something that, that I've leaned in now to for over a decade. Uh, my campaign believes that your zip code should not determine your destiny. And I think that's different in, in politics. Our politics, what makes us different also, is that we're the only true progressive in this race. We were proud to endorse Bernie Sanders for president, and the biggest issue, in my opinion, for this campaign is the scourge of inequality in this country. And that's something that we, in this, um in my role as mayor uh, have, have confronted every day, whether that's uh, fighting for universal pre-K, whether that's confronting our nation's war on drugs. Uh, you know, at, at every juncture, we believe that the, the scourge of inequality must be confronted, and that's a big difference in, in typical American politics. Mr. Vodvarker, how are you different? How am I different? Well, I don't particularly like politicians. I don't see no difference between a Democrat and a Republican. 
It's all by design. They control everything. This is probably the worst this country's ever had. We live in a nation, a great nation that is dying. No government has ever created a job. It's for government to create opportunities for the people to create the jobs. Today, you got all the jobs going to China. China and Mexico and the rest of the world. And they make it like ISIS is the biggest enemy we got. It's not ISIS, it's China. I believe in fair trade. I want to go for the American worker. That's what I stand for. I remember the olden days. I remember how used to be able, how easy it was to get a job and the money that was made. I want to put a great big tariff on all these countries that work for less than a buck an hour, work for food, and they go, ship stuff into America, and there's no tariffs on it. It competes with American labor. I want that to stop. And a TPP, that's something else. That's worse than NAFTA and everything these crumbs have done in, in the past. All of them have to go. We've got to get rid of NAFTA, the TPP. The TPP takes your right away to negotiate. That's, that's so bad. That's worse. I want them Mr. Vodvarker, I'm going to have to interrupt That's you, and, and you'll have plenty of opportunity to continue that train of thought. Thank you. Mr. Sestak, how are you new, and how are you different? <laughs> yes, I'm different. I'm not a politician. I'm a public servant. The proof of that is that when I went down to Washington, D.C., to see the leadership of the Democratic Party, as one senator said, Sestak, whenever I tell you anything, the only answer will be yes. Four and a half million dollars, half of it by my own Democratic Party, has been put in against me. But it's all right, because trust is the biggest deficit we have in America today. They know the system is broken. When I left being a congressman, I turned down the six and seven figure lobbying jobs. I didn't enrich myself for my service. I walked across this state, 422 miles, so people would know that I actually would walk in their shoes not the establishment's views. When the Philadelphia Inquirer, Jim, endorsed me, they said, this is someone who puts principle above party, who's willing to be accountable and can bring integrity of service to people. I did it in the military. I did it as a congressman. I did it teaching and working for lower income and education here in Philadelphia afterwards, and I will do it as United States Senate, despite my establishment party's desires otherwise. Thank you. The next question is going to come from Ilya Garcia of Univision 65, and it goes to John Fetterman. Mr. Fetterman, across the country and right here in Philadelphia, there have been incidents where police and the communities have clashed, creating tension and harsh mm -hmm. attitude towards police. What could you do on a federal level to ease or solve the situation and build stronger bond between the officers and the neighborhood state patrol? Thank you. Well, it, it's not what I could do in Washington. Also, it's what I have done already in my role as uh, mayor of Braddock. Uh, what we've done is we p believe c perfected a community policing model, which led to dramatic drop offs in crime. We went five and a half years without the loss of life uh, in our community. And what we did was we affirmed the values of Black Lives Matter. And we got rid of some of the officers that should have been on the force. We hired some really community oriented police officers and we became uh, the asset that the community always wanted us to be. And we developed trust and we affirmed uh, that you need the police department, but you also need to affirm that in many of these communities where the most tension exists, that we have to affirm the very basic principles of Black Lives Matter. And we are seen as um, an ally, uh, not an occupying force. And we've managed to do all those reductions in crime, create a, a wave of public safety without uh, any kind of increased citizens complaints and certainly nothing of any kind of physical abuse or shootings. Mr. Vodvarker, if you'd like to respond to that question as well. I've been a member of the Sheriff's Reserve back in Pittsburgh since the mid-60s. I'm a life member of the NRA since the mid-70s, life member of the NR, the Ohio Gun Collectors, Force Grove Sportsman in Robinson Township, and I support I support everybody. I support the police. No life is more important than the, another life. All men are, cre are created equal. All lives are created equal. What we never talk about, what's never mentioned, is all the police that are out in the ghettos and all through this country in their police cars. And just being there, how many crimes have never happened? 
They've been stopped just from the sight of the police being there. No one could keep a record of that. The job they do and the people they protect, they're my heroes. All of them, black and white. We all got to work together and stop his hatred, trying to pick on one, you know, over the other. Make these trick questions and that. That doesn't help the situation whatsoever. Mr. Sestak. Jim, I have great respect for the police. I would ride around as a congressman on Friday or Saturday night, like with Superintendent Chitwood in Upper Darby that butts Philadelphia. It's tough out there. It was almost like I felt I was on the ground in Afghanistan again. But I also know this, that black lives do matter, as John said, and our criminal justice system is not just. I go to a prison every year to visit my fellow vets. Many are there for small amounts of drugs that they shouldn't have been in there if we had the right veterans courts or others. The third person I hired on my staff was an African-American who had been incarcerated for about seven years and he does mighty fine. We also know this Black Lives Matter happens elsewhere. Half the children in pre-K that are suspended are children of color. Half those in disability programs that are put into restraints are children of color. We've got to do better than this. That's why I taught at Cheney University, the oldest historical black university. Half the children under three years old today are children of color. In 15 years, Jim, they will be our largest national asset in terms of numbers. If they're not in terms of quality of education, healthcare, and justice, we don't make it. That's why Black Lives Matter to all of us. Thank you, Mr. Sestak. Ms. McGinty. Thank you, Jim. And Ilya, to your question, I mentioned my dad a moment ago, um, served uh, uh, the city as a police officer for 25 years. I think he was the model of community policing. In that 25 years, the gun mm. never left the holster. He walked the beat literally. He knew the neighbors. He knew the leaders in the community. And I think we need to get back to that model. Federal government has a huge role to play to fund and support local communities and being able to invest in genuine real community policing. The training to de-escalate in situations. I think it's vitally important that the uh, ranks of police officers also reflect the neighborhood and so that we have diversity in the ranks. You know, it's not enough though to stop bad things from happening. I think we're losing gain, the ground that have been gained in all of the years of effort on civil rights. And we need to act now to take on the concentration of poverty that we see in our communities, good schools, an inclusive economy, and a real opportunity for everybody to get ahead. Vernon Odom, your question goes to Mr. Vodvarka. Mr. Vodvarka, there is a widespread movement across the country, much of it bipartisan, saying that the prisons are too full of people who are nonviolent and they never should have gone to prison in the first place. It's drug addiction, things like that. If elected to the U.S. Senate, what role would you uh, take in that debate and do you think that argument is one that is real and, and, and should be responded to by our fe at the federal, state and local level? I believe that those people should be given medical attention and help that. Drugs is something, when you get on drugs, my daddy told me that when I was a little kid. He says you never get off them. They're so hard to get off them. You get addicted and that's, to go and punish them is the wrong thing. What they need is help. They don't need punishment. And I'd do everything I could to go and get them medical help, if there's drugs, doctors, whatever it would take to help those people to get them off drugs. That's what we ought to do, not put them in prisons and that, unless they're violent. We got, we got enough people in government that should be put in prison. That's what's destroying this country, the government we got today. It don't care, and it's all by design. If you want to do something, get fair trade in. Let's get the jobs back. All these kids that are on the streets and that, when they go around the corner, look and they find trouble, they'd find a job. Our country would have taxes coming in. The government would have a good tax revenue that they could sure use now. These kids, you, get them, you teach them trades, put them in trade schools and that. They'd have money in their pocket. Mr. We Varker, thank you. a lot you. of lives, thank a lot you, of sir. lives. Mr. Sestak, your response. Yes, Vernon. Uh, this past Veterans Day, I went to Gradyford Maximum Security Prison, spent half a day there with my fellow vets, about 150 of them, just sitting around and talking. I made a few comments to them. There's no more moving ceremony than those who are there and actually at times shouldn't, in many other cases, be there. Again, as I mentioned, these inane laws that were passed in the 1980s, the mandatory, the three strikes and you're out laws, we've got to fix those things. Get the drug courts, get the... Um, 
uh, veterans courts established everywhere. I went to President Chester. That's the first prison we established in Pennsylvania that actually was focused upon drug rehabilitation, but what we let our prisoners out with only 30 days of pharmaceuticals, and then they go searching in the streets. But that's what's good about the Affordable Care Act I fought for, Obamacare. That's what I fought for, because in it, Vernon, there's drug and alcohol addiction parity so that now you can, if we enforce it, get the same amount of treatments for drug and alcohol addiction as you do for a surgical or medical treatment at no more cost. One out of every four families in Pennsylvania suffers from this, and it's not only stopping it from happening, it's helping them when they are on drugs. Thank you, Mr. Sestak. Ms. McGinty. Thank you, and Vern, I uh, believe that we need a wholesale reform of uh, criminal justice and what we've been uh, doing in that regard for the last uh, couple of decades, uh, especially for nonviolent offenses, to take another look. You know, when you think of a young person who is put in prison for having a little pot in his pocket, while the folks who crashed the economy of this country walked free, something's wrong. When you see that in this Commonwealth, we now spend more on corrections than college, north of $2 billion. That's the wrong way to go. Uh, I don't think many people are aware of this, but many of these sentences wind up being permanent sentences. Because even after you do your time, there's a list of some 800 things that you're precluded from doing. Getting a mortgage, availing yourself of affordable housing, what we need to do is equip our returning citizens to be full and productive members of the community and change the laws so that nonviolent offenders' whole lives aren't ruined. Mr. Fetterman. My campaign asked the core question, what would this country look like if we declared a war on addiction 30 years ago instead of a war on drugs? And from that, we have been able to start a conversation through my campaign in the way we look at addiction and treat addiction in this country. It needs to be treated as a medical issue, not as a criminal one. We are not going to be able to ever arrest our way out of it. But let's be honest also, uh, in terms of the warehousing people, the prison population, that gets back to the Black Lives Matter movement because after African Americans are far more disproportionately arrested for crimes, like marijuana, for example. Whites, African Americans use marijuana at roughly the same rate, but African Americans are nearly four times more likely to be charged uh, criminally for it. And that's why I am the only candidate in this race that supports the full legalization of marijuana to remove one of the systemic uh, cases of, of racism in uh, the criminal justice and drug system here in this country. Mr. Sestak, the latest Franklin and Marshall poll uh, uh, asked Pennsylvanians, what issue matters to you most as you go about choosing uh, the next president of the United States? And high up on that list was terrorism, war, and foreign policy. What specifically qualifies you to give your advice and consent in determining how this country should deploy resources, human and otherwise, to protect Americans from terrorism? Jim, unfortunately, in the United States Senate, nor across this whole state, our nation, anyone who's running has the depth and breadth of experience I have from having been to war on the ground in Afghanistan, came in and carried battle groups as we did our strikes, but also working for President Clinton as his director of defense policy to develop the national security strategy of engagement. They sent me to Harvard University for my doctorate both in political economy and national security. So I understood the ebb and the flows of how our economies can affect our security, like with China today. But out of all that, what I learned, Jim, was militaries can stop a problem. Militaries cannot fix a problem. I don't think anyone who's listening to this thinks our military fixed Iraq, despite our bravery of our soldiers. And before you take the very first step into a war, <clears throat> please understand how to secure the peace the day after. We toppled Saddam, but they weren't ready to secure the peace. I want to bring that ability to have a strong military, yes, that could be smaller than it is at less money through cyberspace, but also to where we don't go around this world leading with our military, use it cautiously, don't get us into another tragedy. Ms. McGinty. Well, thanks, Jim. And throughout my career, I've had the occasion to work and be involved in foreign policy matters. Uh, as chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality and a senior advisor to President Clinton, I was centrally involved with him in key issues like 
dealing with the Haitian boat crisis or the aftermath of the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown. Uh, I've lived and worked overseas as well. And so when we talk about some of these trade agreements, by the way, I've seen what it is uh, and how difficult it is for a U.S. company to get any fair shake in those markets overseas. You know, I think we have to be very serious about ISIS, defeat and destroy ISIS. Uh, that means our airstrikes. It does not mean our boots on the ground. And here I have a big disagreement with Pat Toomey. Uh, Pat Toomey, who has done nothing to move along the declaration of war against ISIS that the president proposed well more than a year ago, has do done nothing to move on the nominee that the president put forward, the expert in cutting off financing for terrorists. Those are priorities. I'd push them and I'd be working very closely with the White House on those key issues. Mr. Fetterman. My campaign believes that good judgment trumps bad experience. And for that, I'm referring to this idea that all across the state on this campaign, I have not encountered one single individual that's been happy or pleased or proud of the way Iraq turned out. In fact, it's going to be described as one of the worst foreign policy blunders uh, this government has ever made. And at the end of the day, this idea that there are so-called experts out there, or there are people that understand what things are on the ground, that we can just bomb our way into uh, imposing our, our will and, and our way of life in these countries, uh, we've seen how that worked out. When I was at the Kennedy School of Government, the, the best thing I was exposed to was the thoughts of Robert McNamara, the former defense secretary during the Vietnam War. And the lesson that he said was that the Vietnam War didn't have to happen. And this is a war of choice and it was a mistake. No one learned that lesson. We went into Iraq, another war of choice. ISIS is not ISIS is a threat to the United States, but it's not an existential one, and we can't let it be a gateway into another uh, misgotten war of choice for this country. Mr. Vodvarka. Would you please ask the question again? The question is, what specifically qualifies you to give your advice and consent as a member of the U.S. Senate um, to uh, whether to deploy resources and how to deploy resources uh, in the war against ISIS? A war against ISIS. Well, first of all, I don't believe in going to war, sending our kids anywhere to fight. You got over in ISIS over there in Syria, there's something like three and a half million refugees. And they're all young men, most of them. And they're fighting men and they're good fighters. Why do we have to send our kids over there in the first place to fight a war that's been going on for thousands of years? You want to have a war over there? Arm them. Have their kids fight each other, not ours. I would, you know, I want, I want to see ISIS eliminated. But there are things that are a lot more important than ISIS, and that's China. China got the biggest military in the world. And that's something that's a big threat to us. They could take our satellites out. They go, they make arms to everybody in the world to fight our kids rockets, everything. They probably even give them the nuclear secrets to build a bomb. And then we give them most favored trade status. Let's stop that. So let me ask this question real quick. If the next president of the United States comes forth with a proposal to send substantial numbers of troops to the Middle East to eliminate ISIS, from what I'm hearing, none of you as a member of the Senate would vote in favor of that. Is that correct? How could you send somebody else's kid over there to die? That would be hard. Uh, if, if it was for this country, these are the best kids we ever had in the military. Mr. Sestak, if you're asking under no circumstances, ground, would you vote for that? No, there's no substantive reason to have our troops, ground troops of any mm -hmm. magnitude on the ground right. there because no one's ever figured out yet how to secure the peace once we destroy from the air the caliphate. Mr. Fetterman. How, ma how many wars of choice do we have to undertake in the Middle East before we realize that we have no ability to impose our will uh, and our way of life in these countries? And Ms. McGinty. Jim, we're no, talking no way about you send troops. civil wars, and not only civil wars, but sectarian civil wars that date back 14 centuries. Putting our young men and women in harm's way, uh, I am very hard pressed to see as a uh, anything other than uh, will escalate the situation and worse intentions, so no. Thank you. Uh, Ilya Garcia, you have a question that goes to Katie McGinty. Ms. McGinty, a new report suggests skilled immigrants, skilled immigrants create jobs and companies that ultimately help uh, the economy grow. Do you believe skilled undocumented immigrants 
of workers should be afforded more leeway than unskilled workers to stay here while they seek citizenship and why? Well, first, Delia, um, I believe uh, thoroughly and fully that this country, one of our greatest strengths has been our diversity and the fact that we have attracted talent from all over the world. And we have attracted moms and dads and families that are on fire for our country, wanting to come and give it their all. I'm only second generation in this country. And I know from my grandparents coming from Ireland, they came and they did backbreaking work to help see this country through the Great Recession, uh, the Depression, I mean, as well as see us through World War II, giving children in that war. Immigrants add incredible vitality. I would be full for, for full and comprehensive immigration reform, including a path to citizenship. You know, even recent headlines show what uh, immigrants add to the economic vitality of our country. Uh, recently seeing that more than half of new companies that have reached a billion dollars or more in revenue were started by immigrants. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McGinty. Mr. Fetterman. The, the Statue of Liberty doesn't say, send us your best and brightest only. It says, send us your tired, huddled masses. And that's the message that I believe that we in this country continue to need to embrace. You see some of the hateful rhetoric coming from the other side of the political aisle, uh, calling the, them terrible names that I won't even repeat on, on this stage. And, and that has to change. We have to rise above the rhetoric. One of the most popular themes in the, on the other side is building a giant wall between us and Mexico. Again, an absurd and xenophobic idea. Another the reason I don't support that is because I wouldn't have the beautiful wife and children that I have if we valued one immigrant's lives over the other because my my, uh, my wife was brought here when she was nine years old by her mother fleeing a dangerous and unstable situation in her home country of Brazil and her mother broke her back cleaning houses for 12 hours a day and her my mother or her my mother-in-law took the chances that she need to and as a result I have the beautiful family that I have and my wife has made an amazing contribution to not only our community but our region as a whole. Mr. Vodvarka. Immigrants are beautiful people. They do beautiful jobs. I find nothing wrong with them. I'm all for immigrants, but we have laws. Maybe we could do something where, you know, they could go back to their home country and fill, do everything legal and come back. But we do have laws and those laws have to be obeyed. Sanctuary cities, that's something that's illegal. That's something that we shouldn't have. What the feds ought to do, if you want the government to get into something, they ought to go in there and get the politicians that started these sanctuary cities. Let's put them in jail. You wouldn't have so many. And uh, I'm for the immigrants, but it has to be done legally. As far as a wall goes, I would build a wall. A wall is not going to keep out j j immigrants. It's to keep out the enemy. Right now, it's a porous border. They could bring anything they want across that border. If ISIS is going to come to this country, that's the way it's going to come, across the Mexican border down there. Thank we also got a border up north in Canada. I okay. have to interrupt you, sir. I'm sorry. Thank you. Mr. Sestak. Oh, yeah, we should get both the unskilled and the skilled that are undocumented out of the shadows. If for the unskilled, if they get to the back of the line, we are going to have an increase in productivity from the unskilled of $1.2 trillion in our economy. And we're going to have $600 billion given, as you probably know, into Social Security revenues to salvage that program. Another $600,000 into Medicare, which we saved in the Affordable Care Act up to 2030, but we'll need those revenues. As far as the skilled, let's open up even more that could come in, because 40% of all our Fortune 500 companies are headed by an immigrant or first generation. I know. I didn't only teach at Cheney University, the oldest circle black university, when I turned down those lobbying jobs. I went to the other end of the state and taught at Carnegie Mellon. And in Heinz College there, over half the people there are from foreign countries. Romney had it right. Staple the green card to the diploma. And that's what we have to do is get, because manufacturing is about to come home from China, and we need everybody. Thank you. Our next question comes from Vernon Odom for John Fetterman. Uh, Mayor Fetterman, the Republicans this election year are hammering Ob President Obama saying our military is poorly equipped, drained and demoralized and uh, not effective anymore and it's been ignored and destroyed. Uh, Democrats argue, many of them, that uh, we don't do enough for our veterans who are coming home from all those war zones. Mm -hmm. Where are you on that argument, sir, and <clears throat> what would your role be uh, as a U.S. Senator in, in terms of the military budget 
and the veterans coming home. Sure. Well, I, I think first of all that, that supersedes all of that is 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 not sending our veterans, our men and women, into harm's way for disastrous wars of choice. I think that's the best way I could or any of us, if we were elected, to look after veterans in this country. And without a doubt, the point that you brought up that we have not honored our commitment to veterans uh, in this country. Their suicide rates are deplorable, and the services or lack thereof that they receive upon their return um, that that simply has to change. You know, our military spending is 10 times the, uh, is, excuse me, it's actually more than the next 10 countries combined. We spend plenty on the military. What we should be doing is looking for waste, fraud, and excess in our military budget and removing that from the system and reinvesting that in other areas like healthcare or education. The bottom line is we have the best military in the world and the best way we can look after veterans in this country, in my opinion, is not send them to costly, disastrous wars of choice. Are, are we spending too much on the military? Would you decrease the budget? I, can't, I think it's a conversation that we have to have in this country. I mean, you can't, uh, it's, it's the single largest uh, segment of our, our budget. And at the end of the day, um, the military, in, in essence, has changed. Its mission has changed. We're not going after the Cold War model. We're actually going after small sleeper cells. We're going after ISIS. So, of course, the, these are conversations that we need to have in this country. Mr. Vodvarka, your response. We got the best military in the world, and I've talked to the veterans. And uh, there's nothing too much that you could do for a vet. The worst thing you could do is have the politicians come out there and try to write something up, because it's not gonna be good. My deal with the vets would be that I want them to go figure out what they want, the vets. Then they get me their attorney. When I'm in the Senate, I want their attorney right next to me as a mouthpiece. Whatever they want to present, they're going to get. They're going to get their way. If they'll let the attorney talk, he'll talk. If he won't talk and he's not allowed to talk, then I'll talk. But I want them to be represented by their attorney right in the United States Senate. They'll write up the bill, and I'll, I'll go for that bill. I'll sponsor it, and I'll get it passed. What yes. about the budget, sir? What about the military spending? Is it too military much? Military spending, if you want freedom. Go ahead. If you want freedom... It costs, it's not cheap. You gotta spend money. You gotta have a deterrent. You gotta have the best equipment in the world, and I do a lot of military work. I've been in business since 1978. I'm self-employed. I'm a little manufacturer. I've never had a reject. And uh, the military, whatever it takes, you gotta have the best in the world. Otherwise, when that goes down, and it goes below a certain level, China or someone, somebody in this world is going to attack us. Thank and you, we sir. We don't make anything anymore. That's Thank another you. problem. Mr. Sestak, your response. Uh, Jim, you asked me in the first question, was I different? I was even different in the United States Navy against the establishment. As a three-star admiral, I had to handle this $350 billion program. And I said, we don't need 300 ships. We need only 250. We don't need 54 submarines at $2, $2 billion a pop. We need 35 because our submarines cannot find the Iranian mini submarines with our sonar in the Persian Gulf. And we pass within 1,000 yards of the diesels of China, can't pick them up. But we can develop at less cost a very small device that can pick up a piece of metal, a submarine moving through the water, but disturbs the magnetic field. So the answer to you is yes. We can have a better military at less cost. The chief of naval operations I worked with came in here during my last race and told the Philadelphia Inquirer he was, Joe Sestak was a patriot's patriot. He stood up in the Rumsfeld administration and when everybody else agreed, said no. And that gets to the last point. We just don't want someone to vote down there. We want someone with credibility on foreign policy. Military can actually show with cred, yes, we can have a better military if we dominate cyberspace and not keep building Cold War programs. Thank you, Mr. Sestak. Katie McGinty. Thanks very much. Um, this one's personal for uh, me and my family as well. My brother Jimmy served his country, served our country uh, well and honorably as a Marine. And a couple of years ago had a serious health issue, uh, Vern, that led him to need some help, some assistance. And when we took him to the VA, the VA said, Jimmy's a great guy, bring him back in a year and a half and we might have a bed for him. Look, he'd be homeless, but for the fact that as a family, we were able to pull together. I do disagree with Pat Toomey, who has voted against just about every single veterans uh, uh, bill that would help our vets and their families. In terms of the military and our expenditures there, one, I think it is vital that we retain the ability 
to make and manufacture right here in the U.S. the key and critical equipment that we need. That's not the case today. Spoke the other day to someone who makes artificial uh, intelligence systems for missiles. Unfortunately, the silicon chips you need to embed the artificial intelligence in, no longer any company in the United States that makes that key equipment. That's a threat to our security. We need to build it, we need to make it right here at home. Mr. Vodvarka, the Congress passed a $305 billion transportation bill late last year, but I think everybody in the studio would acknowledge that much of this country's infrastructure is crumbling. Um, not only do we need to build new roads, we need to build bridges, water plants, transportation facilities, and every billion dollars of spending creates about 13,000 jobs. How do you take a pickaxe to the barriers in Congress to rebuild America's infrastructure? How could you make anything, spend any money when you're $19 trillion in debt? You don't have any good jobs in this country. All the jobs are across the pond. You gotta get fair trade. You gotta back the American worker. Let's get fair trade. Let's get it in this country so we could start putting these millennials to work. These are the smartest kids we've ever had. We start getting money, we, we'll build our own bridges. We don't need no stinking politicians to do it. We get them jobs back, the kids will have money in their pocket good jobs, we'll give them educations. That's another thing I wanna do. I wanna start teaching college educations on the internet. The internet is so big, you could teach anything that the human mind can conceive. The kids in the ghettos and that, they could get an education from home, right in the safety of their homes. No one's talking about that. Everything could be talk, taught on the internet. It's something that's being <clears throat> done now. You got, you got somebody that's teaches 25 kids, a good professor, the best, they'll teach 25,000 or 125,000. Thank you, Let's sir. Let's take care of the poor. And Mr. Sestak, everybody. what about our infrastructure? What about infrastructure jobs? Well, you know, I walked across this state and I saw a lot of our roads. I did an event in front of the sinkhole saloon because of the infrastructure that road sinks every two years. Let me give you three examples of how to address it because it's $150 billion, Jim, to fix the waterways, the airways, you know, the roads, the railways that are going to have an increase of 80% by 2030. First, public private ventures like Indiana did. They leased out the roads for tolling to private company, took the billions of dollars they got for that, fixed all their other roads, and now they have a triple A rating. Chicago did the same with its skyline. Second, infrastructure banks. There's a president, Obama has called for infrastructure banks. Pennsylvania has a small one where there's the revolving loans that you can take out in order to do it and pay it back at a reasonable way. And third, because of time, wireless infrastructure. I go into all the 67 counties, 800 events for others over this campaign and others. Go into Elk County, other places, I hold up my iPhone and said, can't use it here. That infrastructure we don't have often because Pennsylvania's legislators, as well as 22 others, the telecoms have rolled in and passed a law that says municipalities cannot develop their own, their own uh, wireless uh, network. That's the establishment. That's where they're wrong. Ms. McGinty. Well, thanks, Jim. There is a bipartisan idea in Washington that I'd like to get behind. It's one that says there's two and a half trillion dollars of corporate profits sitting in banks overseas. And the idea is to offer a tax incentive to bring some of that money back home. I'd earmark it uh, for investment in our critical infrastructure that is so sorely needed. And I think most people in this country know they're not fooled they're paying the price for the poor infrastructure we have, some paying the very highest price. What a disgrace it is that in this day and age we have a situation like Flint, Michigan. But we know there are old lead pipes all over this Commonwealth and country. Let's get at that so that more young children are not paying the price in terms of lead poisoning. Here in Philadelphia, we certainly have seen some of that price as well with not one but two recent Amtrak derailments that literally took life. That's a cost that we can't afford. Let's invest, make sure we have safety first <clears throat> for sure, but an infrastructure on which a modern economy can actually thrive and grow. Mr. Fetterman. My community is actually surrounded by three bridges that were all condemned because they were not structurally able to support the weight of a bus. 
So nobody on this stage knows better than I do just how bad the shape of our infrastructure is in. And again, to me, that always remember that Republicans drive over bridges the way Democrats do. Republicans take the train the way Democrats do. It should be one of our most grounding bipartisan ideas in this country that we need a cutting edge infrastructure and that bill and that time has come now to make those investments, to create the jobs, to upgrade our infrastructures, whether that's our roads, increase the gas tax, People have to understand that you get what you pay for in this country. And in terms of our infrastructure, we are long overdue for a serious upgrade. We're also seriously in need of the jobs that that would create in this country. Ilya Garcia for Joe Sestak. Mr. Sestak, according to the 2010 census, Puerto Ricans make up the largest Hispanic group in Pennsylvania. As it's known by many, Puerto Rico is 72 billion in debt and has no realistic way to pay it back. This has produced mass, a massive exodus of Puerto Rican pe people from the island to the mainland and here in, in Pennsylvania. And also Puerto Ricans living here are concerned about their family members living on the island. What is your position on the fiscal crisis in Puerto Rico and do you feel that Congress has an obligation to help Puerto Rico resolve this crisis? Yes, absolutely. Because a lot of that problem for Puerto Rico, not all of it, as they went out on their own and sold municipal bonds, as you well know, uh, commonwealth bonds at prices they shouldn't have, is our fault. Because we mandated by law in Congress that shipping bringing goods to Puerto Rico had to first come to the United States ports and then go back there to Puerto Rico, raising the cost of all their imports. And Puerto <coughs> Rico's got to import a lot. So we have a shared responsibility here. I've looked at the bill that the Republicans are passing in the House. It's not right. We do should let them do what states do in order to restructure their debt, just like we do in all the states here, because they are a valued part of us as a commonwealth. But let's also move on to other issues for the, for the we got to work in health care for them, because diabetes and heart disease is the biggest among them than almost anywhere else. And education, <clears throat> well, I got to tell you, if we don't do this, we aren't going to have that commonwealth continue on in a prosperous way. But yes, I do, we have to restructure their debt, just like we do any other state. Thank you. Ms. McGinty. Well, thank you, and I, I certainly agree. Look, some of the roots of this uh, challenge and problem date back to 10, 15 years ago, where up until that time, Puerto Rico, like every other political subdivision, had the opportunity uh, responsibly to manage its various debts, including the opportunity when needed to restructure those debts. For reasons that no one seems fully to know, that uh, opportunity was taken away uniquely from Puerto Rico. We need to restore <clears throat> that ability to enable Puerto Rico to manage those debts. Uh, and I think the longer that Congress waits and dithers on this, the situation for Puerto Rico only becomes more challenging because people who have good jobs or had good jobs or are in school are leaving Puerto Rico, taking away that financial base that could help put Puerto Rico back on, uh, on a uh, sound footing. But here's what I think we also need to do, is to recognize that um, when we invest in various projects, those projects need to be paid out over a certain period of time. And that means everyone like Puerto Rico needs to have the full spectrum of financial tools available to them. We've not allowed Puerto Rico to do that, and I would support action to restore that authority to Puerto Rico. Mr. Fetterman. Absolutely, I would support that. Uh, at the end of the day, that's a lot less than the money that the government uh, ponied up to bail out AIG. And AIG and those other companies actually created the mess and the situation for themselves. So you have a situation now in Puerto Rico, it's rapidly deteriorating. There's a moral obligation to intervene. And there's a moral obligation to settle these debts, create a structure where they're able to repay it, restructure it in a way that is both beneficial to their creditors, but also to the country, excuse me, the, the Puerto Rico itself. Um, and uh, as a nation, we can't ever turn our backs on people in that manner. Mr. Vadvarka. You had five people up here, four. Four. four four people up here trying to answer a question that they know nothing about. Something like that should be put on out to the people and it should be voted on this coming November. That's something, you know what I mean, that uh, it should be voted on by the American people. Let them make the decision. What I would do, like Mr. Sestak was saying about him having diabetes and that, I got a plan, I'd like to see a Manhattan style project 
be put in place. Instead of building a bomb to kill people, let's try to cure people. We got the technologies today. Let's get all the money that we're spending on foreign aid. <coughs> Only Israel, I would keep on foreign aid because they're our friends. And I'd get all that money, i try to set up something worldwide with the computers and everything. Let's cure AIDS, let's cure cancer, let's cure diabetes, Alzheimer's, anything. You just put it right there. Let's try to get them all c c cured. Thank That's you, Mr. I Vodvarka. Vernon Odom, your question for Ms. McGinty. Ms. McGinty, voting rights uh, issues won in the 60s have been under attack almost since they were passed uh, by the conservative majority on the Supreme Court, by state legislatures all over the country, from North Carolina to Ohio to Texas. If you're in the Senate, what would your role be in fighting back on that if you think it's a real issue, serious? Well, Vern, I think it's a hugely serious issue. You only have to look uh, at recent primary elections in Arizona, for example, where people were forced to stand in line for four hours plus. That discouraged a lot of vo voters, and I don't think that was unintentional. We saw that here in our very own Commonwealth with the effort to push voter ID legislation, even though uh, the governor at the time couldn't identify a single, a single example of voter fraud. Look, the Voting Rights Act has been under attack, <coughs> uh, and the foolish idea that somehow racism is fully behind us and that we no longer need the protections of the Voting Rights Act uh, is just wrong. As a senator, I would work to restore the full force of the, and effect of the Voting Rights Act. I would make sure when we consider judicial nominees that they understand and appreciate one person, one vote, and the details matter. And I think we need to take further steps to enfranchise people, to enable early voting, for example, uh, and to make it so that we are encouraging rather than discouraging people from exercising this most vital franchise. Mr. Fetterman. This idea of voter fraud is, is the, one of the great Republican boogeymen out there. There are fewer than five documented cases of voter fraud, yet it's constantly put out there that we have to stop this massive wave of, 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 of electoral fraud happening. And it just simply isn't there. And the reality is it's really all grounded in their desire to suppress minority votes that benefit their party. And that, of course, has to be stopped in every turn. I believe also that you know, in my own hometown, uh, in our area, there's a young guy that ran for city council in a town called McKeesport, Corey Sanders, uh, democratically elected, but he was barred from taking office because of a crime, a drug crime conviction almost a quarter century ago. We have to enfranchise people. There are states in this union where significant percentages of people are permanently disenfranchised. We need to change that. And finally, we should give America the day off uh, and be able to vote. Mr. Vodvarka. Well, what I've been through, and it's, it's voter fraud, is a petition challenge by Mr. Sestak over here. You need 2,000 signatures to get on a ballot. I had close to 2,700. He challenged about 1,700. People that write up petition challenges are criminals. The laws are written up for other criminals. They get the little guy off the ballot. The little guy can't run. They want their kids to be in there, but they don't want your kids to be in there. My case was decided by the Pennsylvania Common Court. He had seven Republican judges vote on it. I lost five to two. They voted on old, old case law, okay, which is by way of the dinosaur. I lost, I had to appeal it to the Supreme Court and I won. And sometimes good triumphs evil. And that was about seven days. So I got seven days to run for the United States Senate. Mr. Sestak, I'm sorry, we have to move on. Mr. Sestak. Yes, hi. Um, look, this issue is near and dear to me. Uh, I'd be in the Persian Gulf, and one time I got my vote to vote, my absentee ballot, which a month after, I mean, to send it back after the election occurred. And that happens across the military all the time. And we're improving on it. We worked on it in Congress. But there are things that have to be done because the chances of voter fraud is less than getting hit by lightning. 
what we need to do is have several days for people to vote. It's pretty tough when 20% of work, fa uh, more people are part, and the families are working, both people are working. What we need to do is have it much easier that when you go up and you register for car registration, <coughs> okay, you can register to vote. And what we want to do is be able to uh, actually, maybe we can have the internet to be secure that you can actually do it by internet if we can get it to be secure. I held town halls at this in Cheney University, but the reason it's especially important is because the issue of Black Lives Matter. Half the children, under three of children of color, by the 15 years, they will be our largest voting block. Thank you, we sir. We need to get that education out there and give them e easy access to vote, ready access to vote. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I'm going to ask all of you to limit your responses to 30 seconds because we're almost out of time, but I can get a quick question in. Uh, and that is about fracking. It's, it's almost universally accepted now that fracking will cause some measure of environmental harm, perhaps some measure of health risk. I'm not talking about regulating it. I'm not talking about taxing it. I'm asking you, should there be fracking in Pennsylvania? And I go to Mr. Fetterman. In a perfect world, we wouldn't have had fracking. I would have uh, embraced the, the New York model. Uh, they would have banned it outright. But given the fact that we do have fracking and it's established um, in this state, I support a moratorium on it until two conditions are met. And those two conditions are that we actually charge an extraction tax. We're the only country, or the only state in this uh, country that doesn't charge one. And two, that we develop robust environmental protections to safeguard the environment and our groundwater. Mr. Vodvarka. There's 90,000 people in Pennsylvania that are working in fracking. That's 90,000 jobs, and I'm a laborer. I stick up for labor, okay? I don't want to see no pollution. I'm an environmentalist. But I believe that we have to get that oil out. We still ought to start creating jobs, and I believe what's drilled here stays here. I don't want to see it leaving the country. I'm all for the working man. Anything, anybody that gets in there is the president. If, well, if they will work with the working man, I will work with them. Mr. Sestak. I was for a moratorium to stop fracking in 2010 race, and I still am there today. You probably saw the final study that just came out from the public health, John Hopkins, this week, where they studied Pennsylvania's counties and women who are having babies next to where they're fracking. And the percentage high statistically is enormous for those who are having premature birth and live near where we're doing fracking. Right now, how can we even have fracking when the EPA is not allowed to come in and inspect our clean water, our drinking water, and we know lead is being used by the frackers? We don't want another Flint. Military, you learn, get it right before you do it. And Ms. McGinty. Well, Jim, you know, we've made a mistake in this country with respect to energy. We've put all of our energy eggs essentially in one basket, and that's fossil fuels. When I was Secretary of Environmental Protection, we took a very different approach. We started with energy efficiency, and that's where we should start. But then second, renewable energy. And I am proud to say that we were able to move this Commonwealth to be a leader in the country and in the world in wind energy, solar energy. When it comes to every energy source, though, we do need a tough environmental cop on the beat. We need to make sure we are uh, strengthening regulations and enforcing those regulations, and that's what I would be about. You guys have been terrific. Uh, that's all the time we have for questions and answers. The candidates now have one minute, one minute each for their closing statements, and we begin with Katie McGinty. Well, thanks, Jim, and thanks for having us here. To the voters out there, if you feel like you have been working harder and harder and just falling further behind, I hope you'll stand with me in this election. I'm laser focused on the middle class, rebuilding that middle class. Let's make it so that every child has access to good education, universal pre-K. Let's make it so that as we dream about our kids going to college, it's not going to bankrupt us. I'll fight for that. And you know, after we've worked hard our whole lives, it should be that our wages reflect that, a living wage. And let's make sure too that it's equal pay for equal work. Those are some of the priorities that will make it true again, that when you work hard in this great country, you can and you will get ahead. I believe in American workers. We're going to rebuild our infrastructure. We're going to take on China and anybody else with our technology, with our skilled workforce. We can compete and win. I'm Katie McGinty, and I ask for your help and your vote in this election. Mr. Fetterman. 
For the past 11 years, I've served as mayor of one of the most challenged communities in our Commonwealth. And the issues that I've been working on and exercising leadership with are now at the forefront of the great debate that we are having as a, a party in this country. And those include universal pre-K, adult basic education, the war on drugs, Black Lives Matter, the community policing, uh, immigration, LGBT rights. I was the first elected official in Pennsylvania to uh, officiate a same-sex wedding. These are the issues that I've worked on these are the issues that I fought for and as the one true progressive in this race and the one candidate that has endorsed Bernie Sanders for president I'm asking for your support for the United States Senate to elect and send a true progressive to the United States Senate Mr. Vod Varker I've been off the ballot like I said for about 25 days nobody knows this guy better than I know him he's a real true politician I last week, I had seven days, seven days. I couldn't go, no debates. I wasn't allowed attend, to attend CMU, the progressive debate, and uh, Franklin and Marshall, they kept me from speaking. And I've never been discriminated against in my life. I'm a Kennedy type Democrat. I've never served public office in my life. I'm for the American working people. And nobody knows this guy. If you don't want to vote for me, vote for one of these two here, because I know him. What you see and hear, don't you believe. That's all I could say. Thank you. And Mr. Sestak. Um, everybody listening, please vote. Even if it's not for me, just vote. When we talked about those service members out there, like when I got my ballot late, they're out there protecting your vote. And we should all, even for that reason alone, be enjoying that franchise we have. But that integrity of service that I learned with those service members out there, I joined up during Vietnam. Not a lot did. My country was at war. But when my daughter, after raising to admiral and serving this country, got brain cancer at the age of four, I left the Navy to take care of her. You gave me the health care plan, that took care of her. So I came, I was an independent, became a Democrat because I wanted to work on health care for everyone. I wanted to work, which finally became Obamacare, the only reason I ran. I kept the office open seven days a week to nine o'clock every night. 18,000 of my countrymen and women walked in our door. And I did it because it was like when I joined up with SEALs in Afghanistan at 2 a.m. It wasn't a seven to five job. We had to help them. When I lost, I turned down the lobbying jobs and I went to teach for national youth at colleges. And then I want to bring now trust back to public service, that integrity of service where you're serving others above yourself. Mr. Sestak. I ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sestak. Well, that concludes the debate today, and we would like to thank the candidates for appearing here, and we would also like to thank you for watching. Also, thanks to our panelists, Ilya Garcia of Univision 65 and Vernon Odom of Action News here at Channel 6. For the entire Action News team, I'm Jim Gardner. Thank you.